Thank you for the flattering introduction. The most important uh, fact about my life in the context of today is I was born in Brooklyn. So this is really coming home. Um, so I want to talk to you about uh, first the science of climate change to try to um, clear up any uh, uncertainties you may have about the reality of the problem. And then at the end of the talk, uh, discuss a little bit about what we can do about it. I'll try to move fast so that there's ample time for you to ask any questions you want. And if you'd like to interrupt me while I'm uh, uh, making points, go right ahead. I don't mind being uh, the talk being broken up that way, but I may have to cut it off if we're not making fast enough progress. It exists naturally in the atmosphere. Earth would be something like 60 degrees Fahrenheit colder than it is now. On average, it would be a frozen desert and life would never have evolved. So the greenhouse effect is a good thing. The greenhouse problem is something else again. The greenhouse problem arises because certain of the gases that are there naturally, and then some others, are increasing in their levels in the atmosphere due to human activity. How do we know this? Scientists go to the center of Antarctica and the center of Greenland, where there are these ice sheets that are thousands of feet thick and where some of that ice was deposited from snow tens or hundreds of thousands of years ago. And in fact, some of the oldest ice is almost a million years old. And they use something resembling an oil derrick and they drill down to the base of the ice in some cases. They bring up cores. And if you've ever looked at a chunk of ice out of your refrigerator, say an ice cube, you know it has air bubbles stuck in it. Well. The, uh, the ice that comes out up from the bottom of the Antarctic or the Greenland, Greenland ice sheet also has air stuck in it. It's because ice forms from snowflakes. And when the snowflakes consolidate into ice, the, you know, snowflakes have points. There are molecules of air trapped essentially between the points and on the points. And once it gets consolidated and freezes like the mess we have outside from last week's snowstorm, the air bubbles are just stuck in there. And they are essentially unchanged over some of this ice is hundreds, some thousands, some tens of thousands, some hundreds of thousands, some, as I said, almost a million years old. So when they bring up these ice cores and they bring them into the lab and shave them carefully and let out the air bubbles, they can analyze them chemically. And what they get is a sample of the atmosphere, the air, as it was whenever the ice was laid down. Now here's a relatively new section of ice core the oldest part of it is only 10,000 years old. 10,000 years ago was basically the birth of civilization. And the reason that happened then is that there used to be big ice sheets. One of them came down as far as the middle of Manhattan and Long Island. And you know how there's a, I don't know, you know where all the cemeteries are on, on Brooklyn and Queens? That's a ridge line. That ridge line was laid down by the end of the glacier. Everything to the south of that, the sandy part of Long Island and Brooklyn and Queens and Rockaway and all that is outwatched from the glacier. And, but if you, um, so 10,000 years ago, this plate around here more or less was buried under ice. And then it retreated because the earth warmed naturally for reasons I'll explain in a minute. And the climate warmed and um, the ice retreated back to where it is now, which is basically in Greenland in the Northern Hemisphere and Antarctic in the Southern Hemisphere. So 10,000 years old was a big event. Here's today and this period here is the, you know, slowly the development of civilization. Then you get around here, around uh, 15, 1600, you see a big uh, um, increase in human population. And we see that the this is the level of carbon dioxide they find in the ice cores. And you notice it kind of rocket shoots up at about 16 or 17 or 1800. If you look on this graph, which is just an ex a blown up version of this one, you see that, that CO2 started to increase, increase, and then go up expo exponentially in this century very fast. And that's tied directly to two causes. One, because humans started cutting and burning forests for fuel, first of all, and to clear land for agriculture as the population increased. And then to, uh, they st we started burning coal, oil, and natural gas for factories, power plants to produce electricity, eventually to power our, um, our um, cars and to heat our homes. And that big increase is what we see reflected in this increase of the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So while the level used to be around here before industrialization and pretty constant at 0.03%, 
it's now up here at almost 0.04 percent. So there's been almost a 40 percent increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then we have several other ways we can tie this directly to human activity. Most things about the global warming problem have a, a, a substantial amount of uncertainty attached to them. This does not. There's no doubt that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased. There's no doubt it's due to human activity. And there's no doubt that it's trapping heat and causing some warming of the, pro of the planet. The question is how much and how fast. Let's just look quickly at where all this carbon dioxide comes from in, in terms of the specific sources. First of all, this bar chart shows you that from 1970 to, this is a little bit old now, it's 2004, the emissions of carbon dioxide globally have simply completely uh, just continued to increase. The orange part is, is CO2 here, carbon dioxide, but there are other greenhouse gases. An important one is methane. Methane uh, is the major component of natural gas, so as we developed a big pipeline network and opened up wells to uh, extract natural gas, some of it leaks into the atmosphere. When you open up a coal mine, is natural gas, which causes these explosions in coal mines. That stuff leaks into the atmosphere. It also is a product of uh, rice cultivation. So at the base of the roots of the rice plants, you see bubbles coming up. That's methane. Then there are other greenhouse gases. Nitrous oxide is a small one. That's laughing gas, but it has other industrial and agricultural sources. And all these together have caused an increase of the total amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere which is more or less continuous. If I had the data for the last couple of years, which I don't yet, you would see this tailing off just a little bit because of the global recession. But now it's started to come back up again, particularly because not the United States, but the developing countries like India and China are pumping more and more of this stuff into the atmosphere. And here's the pie chart, which shows the relative importance of these various contributors. The biggest chunk of the pie is the orange, that's CO2 from burning coal oil and natural gas. And here's the, other, the second biggest chunk is CO2 from the cutting and burning of forests, primarily the tropical forests in uh, parts of Latin America, particularly Brazil and uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and parts of Africa. So there's where the stuff comes from. And there's one other point. This is the most complicated slide I'll show. Uh, bear with me a second. This, this slide poses a question. Okay, we're putting this stuff up. If we just stopped emissions, would the problem go away? The answer, unfortunately, is very, very slowly. The reason is once carbon dioxide is emitted, there, there, there's no quick way to get it out of the atmosphere. It's removed, it's removed by photosynthesis. That is, plants, for instance, will remove CO2 because they make themselves out of the carbon and CO2. But when they die and turn over again, the CO2 just goes right back in the atmosphere. Plus there's a huge increase in the amount of biomass on Earth's surface, which there isn't. In fact, the reverse is happening due to deforestation. We can't get rid of a lot of carbon dioxide that way. The other, th the other way we can get rid of carbon dioxide is it can dissolve in the ocean and eventually goes to the bottom of the ocean and stays there for a long, long time. But that's a very, very slow process. So imagine this, um, let's just follow this one curve. If you just let carbon dioxide grow as it's growing now for about 100 years, and then you, sh uh, and then you just shut off. You took every uh, car and you drove it right into the Hudson River. You took every power plant and you blew it up. You stopped every factory. You shut off your oil or gas burner in your household and you froze. How quickly would the carbon dioxide that had been produced by all those sources get out of the atmosphere? The answer is very slowly. Here's what, here's what it get, would get up to at the peak in this one scenario. But then after you shut everything off, an impossible thing to do, but it's the best case one could imagine. You know, in the year 20, this is 2000, this is 2100 where the peak happens, 2200, there's still two thirds of it is still there. You don't get anywhere near in this whole millennium, 3000, you don't get anywhere near where the natural level is, which is way down here. And that means that the temperature, which is this graph, just stays up there for a very long time. And this is important because it means the decisions we make today to either control or not control carbon dioxide reverberate for many, many, many generations. These other curves here show what happens if you decide earlier to, than 2100 to cut, cut off the carbon dioxide. And the answer is it's still very robust, but of course it levels out 
at a much lower level than if you just let things rip for a century. So the question is, is it possible to get on one of these other emissions trajectories and slow the problem down so we're not stuck with this vast overburden in the atmosphere and therefore a very big temperature change? So, okay, there's a problem of some size. Second question, is that manifest already? I've pr pr proposed a theory to you, but I haven't yet proposed any evidence that the climate is actually changing. Let me now do so. These are three different measures of climate change and its effects on the system, the Earth system that we operate in. And, the qu and these are all historical curves. They start in 1850 here, and they end at about 2005. And I'll show you some later data in a minute. This is Earth's global mean temperature. If you took the measurements on all the thermometers around the world, and there are thousands of them, and you averaged it, and you said, what's the average temperature of the Earth? It's something around 57 degrees Fahrenheit, if you, you know, all year, all the time. Um, and you just put those on a graph, and you ask, what's it been doing? Well, we, have the, we had enough thermometers by about 1860 to do some reliable measurements. And this is r r recent years. And you see it is a, uh, uh, a scatter step, sort of a, a little herky-jerky movement. But basically, it's been going up. And so right now, the temperature of Earth is something like 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, about 0.8 degrees Celsius, the scales in Celsius, higher than it was 150 years ago. Earth is warmer. There isn't any dispute about that. No one is arguing about it. It's a fact. And we can see this reverberate through the Earth system. As Earth warms, sea level rises. Why does sea level rise? Because, number one, Almost any fluid you can name will expand when you heat it. So seawater expands, it takes up more volume. The glaciers in the mountains, like Glacier National Park or the Alps, they tend to melt if they get warmer, and that's happening, and we verified that. And the third thing is that the two major remnant portions of ice from the ice ages, the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet, are also at their edges, at their peripheries, starting to lose ice, more ice than they gain by snowfall. And so on balance, water is being transferred into the ocean from ice, and it's also expanding. And that's what this reveals. Sea level rose about uh, seven inches over the last, the past century, from about 1900 to today. And that may not seem like a lot, but on your typical beach here, if sea level rises one foot, let's say, you take away 100 feet inland by inundation, erosion, submergence, it just disappears forever unless you come with a truck and dump more sand and that's a very expensive proposition and it's done at a lot of the beaches, Coney Island, that's, you know, they do it, Rockaway they do it, but we can't afford to do it forever on all the beaches that we use. So, they, it, so there's a risk there, sea level definitely rising, the rate apparently has increased recently and we have very good measurements of this. The blue line is what we know from what are called tide gauges, they're flotation devices that go up and down with the tides, but also with the sea level. But the red curve, which matches the data very well and is available for the last approximately 20 years, is satellite data where they use a laser, or uh, some of them use lasers, some of them use radar, and they bounce a signal off the ocean surface and it's retrieved by the satellite and they can tell how high the sea surface is. And we confirmed the 100-year record by doing that satellite measurement. And then the third is snow cover. This may not seem very convincing in light of the last couple of winters, but on average, it happens to be that snow, the snow line, although it's very noisy, does go up and down year and year out, year and year out, has been retreating. So if you put a post in the ground in, say, Wisconsin in April, the snow line where there's a snow cover would have run past that post. I don't, I'll make up a date. April first now instead of April 8th, 50 years ago. So there's been a retreat in the snow line. And these are, there are other measures of, of spring coming earlier. So these are all indications, confirmations of the thermometer data that Earth is warming. So temperature up, sea level up, glaciers and snow lines retreating. Incidences of extreme heat, like the 100 degree days we had this summer in New York, or the great heat wave in Russia. Uh, heat waves are increasing in frequency and periods of extreme cold are decreasing. You may think this is a lousy winter, but the temperature hasn't dropped below zero degrees yet. And if you think back, if you're old enough to remember, it's really conditions in recent winters have been relatively mild. 
even when there's, even when there's snow. Snow season is shrinking. Uh, the intensity of rainstorms is increasing in areas like this simply because as the earth warms, water evaporates from the ocean surface faster and that feeds rainstorms when it's raining. On the other hand, in areas that are dry, the extra heat tends to dry out the soils further. So we have the weird, um, we're hit with a double whammy. Areas that tend to be wet uh, anyway are getting wetter, but areas that tend to drought, as I'll show you in a minute, are getting drier. Hurricanes appear to have take, undergone a shift from the category one and two, the uh, relatively modest intensity ones, uh, with fewer of them and more category four and five. And finally, the ocean is gradually turning more acid simply because carbon dioxide is an acid when it dissolves in water, and that causes the surface layers of the ocean anyway to turn somewhat more acid, which is not a good thing because shell-forming creatures, which are the base of the marine food chain, they can't form their shells as the ocean gets more and more acid, and eventually there's going to be a problem with the entire marine food chain due to that. But don't think every thing that's weird that happens in the weather is something that has to do with global warming. It's not so. Many things are not changing. At least we can't detect that they're changing. Uh, storms, non-tropical storms, non-hurricanes, the kind we get in the winter that come up the coast, no evidence that they're changing on the whole. Uh, and uh, the sea ice in Antarctica has not shrunk. And I'll show you the Arctic sea ice in a minute. And for instance, tornadoes have not gotten more intense as far as we know. There are a few other categories like that. But aside from those changes, there is a, uh, those lack of changes, there is across the climate system a very, very pervasive change. Now this is the latest data, uh, including 2010, which was either the warmest or tied for the warmest year on record. And again, don't be fooled, the record bounces a lot. And sometimes people will say, well, you know, it was, it was colder in 2007 than in 1998. But you know, the, it's 1998, but so what? It's a noisy record, but you can see the trend is upward. Climate varies naturally for lots of reasons. The sun's intensity bounces up and down a little bit. The orbit of Earth changes a little bit, and that changes the amount of sunlight coming to Earth over long periods of time. That's why we go in and out of ice ages, although there isn't one due for about 30 or 40,000 years. So that's not going to save us from the problem. And, there are, and there's just random fluctuations. It's what's called a chaotic system. But on the whole, you can see what the trend is pretty clearly if you step back. So if we happen to get, and, and also, you know, the Northeast United States is a little dot on a map. It doesn't mean much in terms of the global average. So if you stand back and ask what's happening to the world as a whole, the picture is quite clear. And yeah, I, this slide is a little out of order, but one of the best indicators of climate change is the fact that, as predicted, the sea ice in the Arctic is retreating and retreating very fast. The red line, if you can see it, is what the Arctic sea ice cover was in a typical end of the summer in, uh, when the ice is at its minimum in um, 1979 when the first satellite measurements came in, and then the white is what it looked like in 2003, a, a fairly recent year. And this is if you put all the data from the whole sequence on. The end dropped off here. It, 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 it's, <laughs> it's unfortunate because, it, again, it's very variable. And uh, recently, there was this big down year when there was big decrease in Arctic sea ice. But it's, it's since come back. But what it's come back to is the downward sloping line. So that there's, a, there's just a continuous trend for the last, uh, what's over 30 years now, in Arctic sea ice. And despite the ups and downs in individual years, it's basically headed down. And eventually, sometime in the second half of the century, the summer sea ice goes to zero. And that has reverberations around the climate system because sea ice itself reflects sunlight. It's what's called uh, the existence of sea ice is a feedback on the climate system. If, it, if the climate system is getting colder, there's more sea ice, there's more reflection of sunlight off that shiny ice cover, and it reinforces the cooling. We're going the opposite direction. As we get warmer and we reduce the amount of sea ice, this nice white here, which reflects sunlight in the summer, tends to shrink, it's replaced by this dark blue, which is the ocean absorbing sunlight, and it reinforces the warming. Oh my God, I'll never get through this. All right, I'll rush. So, drying, much of, there's been a tendency to increase in the area affected by drought, which is the red areas. See, this is a complicated graph, 
but basically the point is we're getting droughtier uh, in areas which are already dry. Wait a minute, I went up there, sorry. Um, now, we, what we project for the rest of this century is that these changes will lead to an eventual warming of something in the neighborhood of about five degrees Fahrenheit if we don't restrain emissions over this century. That would be the biggest climate change since the retreat of the great ice sheets, which uh, 10,000 years ago, and of course it's all in the warming direction, it will make Earth warmer if it happens than any time in the last at least three million years. Or, you know, and at that time, you know, Earth was a much different place. And in fact, if we keep the warming going, Earth will probably get warmer than it's been in the last uh, approximately 60 million years when the dinosaurs were still around and 65 million years. And Earth was completely different then. It's not that there weren't, weren't a lot of living things. It's not like humans are gonna go out of business. It's just the amount of change that that implies telescoped into 100 years instead of several million years is immense. And it's not clear how effectively we could deal with it. Why should you believe those projections? The projections are made by what are called computer climate models. These are simulations of Earth's climate. They, they are somewhat they somewhat resemble weather forecasting models, only they don't try to give you the weather, the, what the climate's going to do in the next day or in any particular day. They give you averages over long periods of time, and therefore, in some sense, in some ways, they're even, even better than weather prediction models. And if you take those models and you take the amount of greenhouse gases that we know is in the atmosphere over the last hundred years, and you ask, are they, do they tell you what the climate should have done over the last hundred years? Because if they can't do that, why should I believe them, their projections for the next hundred? You actually can do it continent by continent. The pink area, the, the, the black in each of these cases overlaying each of these continents is the actual temperature change for that continent. And the pink spread is what the climate models project it should have been. And you can see within a fairly, within some substantial uncertainty, the models did a good job. The blue streak in each case is what happens if you take the greenhouse gas buildup out of the models and you ask what would have natural climate changes done over, the time, over that time? And the answer is they would not have given you anything that looks vaguely like what actually was measured, which is the black curve. Why is there such a big spread in the pink? Why can't we predict that black observed temperature curve on the mark? The reason is simply that there are, big, there are parts of this system we do not understand. And the easiest one to talk about is clouds. Um, when, water when the earth warms, water vapor evaporates from the ocean surface. It can form two kinds of clouds. Low-lying clouds tend to reflect a lot of sunlight, the kind of clouds you have out there today. High clouds, the tenuous, filmy ones that if you're in an airplane at 30,000 feet, you tend to, they tend to make you bump. Those actually act like greenhouse gases as well. And we, we don't have a good picture of how much of each type changes, whether one increases or one decreases and where. And until we can get a better, better measure of that balance, our climate predictions are actually going to be quite uncertain. So, uh, yeah, let me, the, this is the, the, the range of projections of the climate models. Basically, depending on what our emissions are, the warming over this century could be, and how sensitive the climate system is, the warming could be rather modest. Just This is in Celsius, so that's about two degrees Fahrenheit or it could be stark, about six, degree, about six degrees Celsius, which is about 11 degrees Fahrenheit. And so, and we just don't know. It's, it's a gamble, and it's a gamble we can't get a better fix on. So we're in no position to be able to affect how the climate responds to this buildup of gases. And we are, it's gonna be years, if not decades, before we can narrow the uncertainty and give ourselves a better answer about um, how sensitive the climate system is. The one thing we can do to increase the odds of not having a radical climate change like this is slow down the emissions of the gases so we have a future which is more likely in here. But one way or the other, it's going to warm. It's going to warm for some time. Let's see, this is not necessary to show. Uh, yeah, let me show this. This is kind of instructive and then I'm gonna jump to just talking about what we can do about the problem. There was a big heat wave in Europe in 2003. And if you had asked people before that heat wave happened, asked experts, what's the worst heat wave you can imagine in a developed country? 
how many people would die due to the direct and indirect effects of the heat. You, you know, people would have said a few hundred because that was the previous experience in a country like the U.S. or in Europe. In this heat wave, the, the number of deaths is now thought to have exceeded 35,000. Uh, we still don't have a good picture of why it was that bad in terms of the inability to keep people from expiring due to heat exhaustion, due to air pollution that accompanies stagnation, etc. But we do have a picture of what the, what the climate change was and what it says about the future. So here's the area affected by the heat wave. Here's, it was right sort of in eastern France. Here's this curve. This is every wi uh, summer in that region what the average summer temperature was, and this was the summer of 2003. You, you notice, if you know anything about statistics, this is way outside what the, the mean of the distribution is. It's, it's what's called like 10 sigma, way, way outside probability, or the prob what the probability said should have happened. It was what's called a once in a thousand year event. We can actually ask, okay, say these climate models are right, what happens in the future? It turns out this summer of 2003, instead of being a once in a thousand year event, if we let the greenhouse gases build up, it becomes the typical summer for that part of Europe. And you see a similar change for the United States. So that's a good reason not to be so happy about the buildup of these gases. Sea level rise, again, future sea level is, is, is uh, projected to just keep increasing. This is Atlantic City, and it reveals some of the stupidity of our present management of the coast. You know, this stuff is at sea level. What happens when there's a sea level rise? Final, um, uh, I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm gonna rush. This is the, if, if parts of the ice sheets start to really go fast, this is the red area is the area of the east coast that would eventually come underwater if there's a substantial loss of one of the ice sheets. Um, so what can we do about this problem? Is there any way to actually bring it under control? The answer is yes, and in an odd way, a lot of progress has been made, even while the U.S. government hasn't really developed a coherent policy on it. You might have been aware that the U.S. Congress failed to pass legislation last year, which would have started limiting the emissions of these gases. But due to a variety of things that are happening voluntarily, partly because interest, interest, some companies are looking forward and, and expect that the government will eventually regulate these gases, uh, partly because of technological developments that are fortuitous, uh, partly because there's a, a big federal subsidy on alternative energy now, like wind power, and partly because energy prices went up and people started buying energy efficient equipment, including through probably some decisions you, you yourselves made, the U.S. emissions of the greenhouse gases have actually decreased in the last 10 years. And part of that is due to the recent uh, recession, but most of it actually had started to happen before the recession. So there is a transition happening anyway, if too slowly, in the way we use and produce energy and therefore in our emissions of the greenhouse gases. And you yourself can help contribute to this uh, sort of effort. Um, when you buy a car, the fuel economy of the car is directly is what's called inversely, inversely proportional to the carbon dioxide emissions. The higher the fuel economy, the lower your emissions. If you, I'm not going to tell you what kind of car to buy, whether to buy a hybrid or a non-hybrid, but if you look at the sticker and you see what the fuel economy is, the higher the fuel economy, you save money, and you also contribute less carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Um, you know, I don't own a car. I take the subway. That's a much more efficient way to get around than in New York City. It's a practical thing to do. You should check the efficiency. Check the efficiency when you, of a, a, any equipment you buy. When you buy a, a stove or when you buy an air conditioner or when you buy a refrigerator, they've all got efficiency stickers on them. The higher the efficiency, the less electricity they use. The electricity we use here is partly generated by nuclear power, which doesn't generate carbon dioxide emissions, but it's mostly generated by burning coal or natural gas somewhere, largely not in New York City, the power plants are generally elsewhere, and those contribute to carbon dioxide. So if you buy light bulbs, like the compact fluorescent light bulbs that are efficient, or high efficiency appliances, you know, looking at the yellow efficiency sticker, or a heating and cooling system for your house, or an air conditioner, whatever it is, you look for the efficient one, you'll be generating less carbon dioxide emissions. And keep them maintained. 
you know, fuel economy of a car when you buy it is different from fuel economy of the car on the road. If the tires are inflated right or if it's out of tune, it's not being as efficient. It's producing more carbon dioxide emissions. Finally, there's a lot of political activity that's going on. The US EPA is about to issue regulations, which over the next few years will start to limit the carbon dioxide emissions from power plants. The federal government is tightening the fuel economy standards for motor vehicles, so it will be impossible to buy a, a, a very inefficient car, essentially. And New York State itself is part of a regional compact, which limits the emissions of carbon dioxide from power plants. So things are gradually starting to happen. At the international level, the U.S. has been in negotiations with, uh, with the other countries for many years now. And finally, slowly, there's some indication that the big developing countries, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, which have a lot of coal use and carbon dioxide emissions, are moving towards reducing their emissions. So um, the way I look at it, we're in the middle of an energy transition. Um, if we look back 30 or 40 years from now, Hopefully, we'll have seen a transition been made and carbon dioxide emissions not gotten completely out of control. And we'll be in a situation where the Earth will be modestly warmer, but the future will be towards stabilization of the climate rather than sort of an exponential increase in temperature. But it is not guaranteed. And it will take political leadership and it will take ac action by all of us as individuals to bring that about. So we're sort of at a pivot point and we have a decision to make about you know, how much, how fast, and how far we should go in terms of pushing the reductions of these emissions. Given that there's a lot of scientific uncertainty about whether we're going into a moderately warmer world or a much an intolerably warmer world, uh, it's completely understandable that governments, individuals, companies would step back and think about the science a little bit and say, how big is this risk really? But the scientific basis is firm. There is, a, there is a high risk. We're not certain about the outcome, but the likelihood of a really bad outcome is high enough that I personally would want to sit here and do nothing about the problem. So I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. New Orleans, you know, it's a be beautiful city, wonderful culture, but there should never have been a city there, basically. It was started out low, and then due to withdrawal of groundwater, for instance, and settling, it's a delta, it's deltas are silty, they just get compacted, the place sunk below sea level. And they gradually built levees to protect it from the sea. And uh, the levees weren't um, well enough maintained, nor high enough in the beginning, to protect them from Katrina. Katrina itself probably had nothing to do with global warming, but it is uh, an analog of what happens in a strong hurricane and what would happen more and more in the future when you have a vulnerable situation. That's why I put up this, the uh, picture of Atlantic City. You know, there's a lot of the U.S. that's exposed that way, although New Orleans is probably the worst case. Yeah, they've had incredible... You see, that's an interesting... What's going, we're not sure, but it's, a, it's, um, it's maybe an indication of... Uh, uh, a sort of an incipient effect of the climate change because it had the characteristics that one would expect from global warming. Australia's semi-arid, so it goes through these periods of very dry and then w very wet, like parts of California. What happened, what ha appears to have happened, those cycles are natural. The cycles are being intensified by the greenhouse effect, we think, so that when it's dry, it's drier. They had a terrible five-year drought before this flood, and now they've had this incredible flood. So th that's why I said before, both ends of the spectrum get emphasized. Some of it is, but that's not, the main problem is basically there are mountains, rain will, comes down, this bush or washes out. Well, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what episode you're talking about, but that's, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that has nothing to do with global warming. What we can say about birds and global warming is that their ranges are changing. That is, the climate that they're adapted to is moving northward as, the climate warms so that certain birds that we used to find only in the south, like mockingbirds, you see them up here very commonly now. Their range has shifted, but birds are lucky. They can fly, they can move, they can change their home. Trees can't do that, so certain species that aren't as flexible as birds are going to go out of business because they can't move. Yeah. So at the it, it, yeah I yeah. So I have a pic I have a picture of that, and. Um, 
So these, this, is, this is goes 400,000 years ago, and the data actually now go about 800,000 years. They haven't fully analyzed the billion-year-old data. And these are two curves. One is the uh, uh, amount of carbon dioxide in the ice cores. And you notice it goes up and down, and the reason, and, but over hundreds of thousands of years. Here's today, by the way. The re uh, today is actually up here. At the, uh, it fell off. There's a red dot up here, which is today. The reason it goes up and down is, every, as I said before, Earth's orbit changes gradually. When it changes, it brings more sunlight to one or the other hemisphere, and that changes the climate. But that's a very slow process. So in the depth of the last ice age was here. This is Earth's temperature. I won't go into how we know that. Temperature was low, carbon dioxide was low. Now, temp carbon dioxide's up and temperature is up. And that pattern reproduces itself throughout the whole 800,000 year ice core record. And that's one of the reasons we believe these, that the projections are correct, because there's a long-term correlation between carbon dioxide and actually the other greenhouse gases too and Earth's temperature. Before the current era, this was all driven by natural change. Now it's being driven by the, the human-made buildup of the greenhouse gases. In this whole period of 800,000 years, carbon dioxide levels were never higher than 0.03%, and now they're already at 0.04%. So we already have higher carbon dioxide levels than for several million years certainly cuts down the possibility of a piece of legislation going through the Congress. But on the other hand, the administration has indicated they're going to use their regulatory authority to do not as much as they would have been able to do through legislation, but to build, start building a serious program. Um, the, what troubles me most about the new members of Congress is that many of them are um, sort of resistant to scientific arguments. It's as if they don't want to know. And more than that, they have indicated an interest in persecuting the scientific community for talking, for showing the facts. And one of them, uh, Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma, put, uh, posted a list of 17 scientists, I'm uh, graced with having my name on the list, that he thought should be indicted potentially by the Justice Department for um, misrepresenting the, the, the case. Now, this is a comic act, basically. But it's it, some of the scientific community has gotten very worried about this, and you're going to see young scientists not want to go in areas like this because, you know, what, what do they need the headache? I don't care, you know, I'm not afraid of these guys, but if I were 25 years old and picking a career, I might think twice about it. It depends on how you do it. Um, if, uh, organic is a label which covers a lot of good and bad stuff at the same time. Um, the general principle, I think the most important thing to get at with farming is that if we all stayed away from beef, we'd be doing the world a favor. And I have to say, I eat beef sometimes, too, so nobody's a saint. At least I'm not. Um, the reason is that the, the amount of energy that gets used pushing the food up the food chain so that you go from a grain that then cattle eat, um, in that process, not only is a lot of energy used, but a lot of methane is released by the cattle. Cattle flatulence releases methane, for instance. So that the one thing I feel confident at, having looked at the analyses, is the environment in general would be better off if we were all vegetarians. Now, it's probably not going to happen. But, you know, so I try to not eat beef more than once a week or maybe once every two weeks. Um, but organic in general, it depends very much on the details, and I don't want to make a general statement. Carbon sequestration, let me explain, is a process by which the carbon dioxide is removed before it gets out of the power plant plume and is captured by a chemical process and then regenerated and stuck underground in essentially deep wells 1,500 feet below the surface, for instance. And it's thought that it can stay there. Um, there are two things about this process that need to be understood before we implement it. And there are some experiments going on now. One is, uh, how cheap can you make it? Notice that it's a great idea, but if it doubles, triples, quadruples the price of energy, the likelihood of doing it is relatively small. It will be politically impractical. Number two, does the stuff stay down once you put it down? We don't know the answer to that either, but there are experiments going on around the world to try to test it. So it's a maybe. And that, you know, will that work? Will solar photovoltaic cells become cheap enough? Princeton University is just putting in a bunch of them, and it turns out with the tax breaks that they can get, it's a cheap, cheaper than any other way they can produce new energy sources. Others are doing the same thing. A lot of wind power happening. 
which of these is really going to catch on and replace coal over the long term, particularly in a country like China that has a lot of cheaply available coal, we're not sure. But that's human progress. A lot of alternatives, a lot of people, clever people try it, a lot of different things. Hopefully some of them will work. Okay. So the biggest threat to food supply is particularly not so much in the United States, but in these developing countries like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or India or parts of Mexico where the agriculture is in semi-arid areas, tends to still be subsistence ag agriculture, those areas are probably going to get drier. It's going to be harder and harder to cultivate. Also, it gets get hot. The, the, uh, some crops, like corn, has trouble tasseling when it's hot. Too hot, too dry. More carbon dioxide tends to help. It tends to uh, plants like that. On balance, the too dry and too hot are going to win in a lot of these places, and you're going to see agricultural prospects shrink. It's thought that if the world gets somewhere between, as the temperature goes from one degree, one, uh, two degrees Fahrenheit, four degrees Fahrenheit, five degrees Fahrenheit warmer, when you get in that range is where you hit agriculture hard. In the U.S., what will happen is agriculture will tend to move more north and somewhat east. A place like Minnesota will have a longer growing season. We'll be okay, probably. Places like India, I'm not so sure. We don't know. There's a lot of methane there. It got sort of buried uh, geologically. Uh, and as it, it, it's in a form called clathrates, where it's combined with water and frozen. As the tundra melts, which is happening in various places, some of that gets released. We, the biggest supplies are actually under the ocean, uh, the shallow coastal areas, say, north of Siberia. We really don't know. It's one of the big unknowns. Uh, there's no indication yet that there's a big release starting to happen, but the amount we don't know about it is vast. So it's a, a, a troubling uncertainty, one of many. Okay, so let me take the second question first. There isn't a scientific theory or fact alive that doesn't have some people who contradict it, even some knowledgeable people. Uh, there's a very famous and knowledgeable biologist who still disputes the notion that AIDS is brought about by the HIV virus, you know, despite all the evidence uh, in the other direction. And there's nothing you can say about it. You know, humans, even smart humans, will hold weird opinions. And so the way we feel confident about this is that the academies of science of all the major countries, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the British Royal Society, I could go endlessly in this long list, all of them have repeatedly looked at the problem and said the fundamentals are sound, that carbon dioxide is, has already caused some warming and will cause more if the emissions aren't limited. I don't know what to say beyond that, except that it's, you know, that's where the weight of the scientific community is. As far as the question of whether there's ever been an era where, I think you asked, where temperature went up without carbon dioxide going up, is that what? Yeah, and temperature went If you go far enough back, tens of millions of years, it's a cloudier picture. Well, all we know is that over time, that there were many factors that affected Earth's temperature, Earth's orbit, as I've said, the amount of volcanic activity, because volcanoes actually put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the positions of the continents, because if there's a continent in one place, they can reflect sunlight and cool the Earth. If it's in another place, they can't. The changes in ocean currents. We have only the sketchiest information over that many tens and hundreds of millions of year period. But as best as we can tell, overall, when carbon dioxide has been high, Earth's temperature has been high. When carbon dioxide has been low, Earth's temperature has been low. And the closer you come to the modern era with better and better data, the more certain we are. Okay?